It's really kind of hard to believe how much Qantas fares are considering how cramped their economy is. We're going to do a full trip report today exploring the airport, the airline, and the onboard experience. So let's get into it. Welcome to Auckland. If you'd like to know the exact fare that I paid for this flight or my next five videos in queue, please check out the description below. And if you're new here, hi there and welcome to the channel. My name is Kevin. I'm of the opinion that the world needs a bit more honest travel content these days. So I make airline trip reports, high-end hotel reviews, and cruise ship tours as well, all without invitation. I always film without the company's knowledge and self-fund my own trips to be sure I get a true experience. Then I give you nothing more than my own personal, honest, unbiased opinion. We are now on our way to Auckland International Terminal. Perhaps it's not the fanciest or most glamorous terminal out there, but credit where credit is due. It just works. The queues weren't that long, there's plenty of shops, decent selection of food, and a few up close and personal plane spotting locations. Not a bad place to be. There was only one option for this flight, as in one option for the airline that I was going to fly. From Sydney, I flew Fiji Airways. From Fiji, I flew Air New Zealand, and so it was only fitting that heading back to Australia, I had to fly Qantas for the first time for me. I always monitor my flight seat maps pretty intensely, and today was showing a completely sold out flight. So I was genuinely surprised when arriving to find a nearly empty check-in counter and thought perhaps the seat maps were wrong. I even bid for an upgrade and my not so secret method of always getting an upgrade completely failed. My method for bidding on any upgrade, by the way, is to bid the price at the third click up from the lowest price. So if the lowest bid is $300 and the ticks are up in $15 increments, I would bid $345. I honestly, I don't think it's ever not worked for me before. Anyway, check-in was obviously speedy, though Qantas is low-cost carrier level restrictive when it comes to carry-ons. So I was forced to check in my bag for being two kilos overweight. The check-in agent would do well with a bit of tact, but yes, yes, those are the rules. I do kind of feel like I'm on a patronizing check-in agent streak lately, though. As we quickly head through security and pass through a load of duty-free, seriously, duty-free in Australia and New Zealand is no joke. Let's talk a bit about Qantas and the Flying Roo. Qantas, which I just learned yesterday stands for Queensland and the Northern Territory Aerial Services, is the world's second oldest continuously operating airline, having commenced service in November of 1920. The predecessor of Avianca is 11 months older, but they haven't operated as one entity continuously. And then we have the big daddy of them all, KLM Royal Dutch Airlines, which by all metrics is the oldest, predating Qantas by 13 months. To pass a bit of time and get some lunch, I headed up to the Strata Lounge, which I accessed with Priority Pass. The lounge was frankly a lot nicer than I was expecting for a no-name contract lounge. Plenty of seating, functional charging ports, and quite a few food and beverage options as well. Founded by a trio of Aussies, they began operations flying an Avro 504K, purchased for £1,425, which carried a whopping two passengers cruising at a cool 65 miles per hour. In their first decade, they flew mainly rail services between rail stations in Western Queensland. Towards the end of their first decade, they began flying seven de Havilland HD50s that they actually built themselves under license. Fast forward to 1935 and Qantas teamed up with Britain's Imperial Airways to form Qantas Empire Airways Limited or QEA. Hopefully not QEA. They launched their first international service soon after, linking the cities of Darwin and Singapore, forming the first segment of what would eventually become the first kangaroo route. By the way, I'm going to interrupt myself here now and mention if you do enjoy honest travel content, especially trip reports with a bit of history, then make sure that you subscribe because next year, I know it's a long way off, but next year I have quite possibly my coolest ever trip coming together and it's got a little bit of something to do with the kangaroo route. In the meantime, to pass those 
eight months, feel free to click that thumbs up button as many times as you'd like. Ring that bell to your heart's content and then check out my Patreon linked in the description below. Thanks for watching today. Good timing for our One World special livery A330 to land inbound from Brisbane. Following their international debut, they continued to expand their network, and in 1944, they debuted their kangaroo logo, which was used on their first route, which led to Karachi. From Karachi, BOAC took over and continued onto the UK, thus forming the first true kangaroo route. Fast forward a few decades, and in 1992, they were merged with the nationally owned domestic airline, Australian Airlines, and fully rebranded back to Qantas the following year. In 1998, they became a founding member of the One World Alliance and were riding high until 2000, when Virgin Blue entered the market and tried to rain on their parade. To respond to the market share that Qantas began shedding pretty quickly, they launched Jetstar, their low-cost carrier, in 2001. And, luckily for Qantas, that was also the same year that Ansett Australia collapsed. So, by the end of the year, Qantas's market share was nearly approaching 90%. Qantas currently serves 93 destinations across the globe using their fleet of 125 aircraft, with a further 61 on order. I will say, 61 aircraft that will completely transform their fleet to a level that no other airline, except perhaps Emirates, could also claim at the moment. Qantas have A220s, A321XLRs, and A350-1000s on order. In this case, the A220s are surprisingly pretty unremarkable as they're not going to change the dynamic of anything. But the A321XLRs? Those will be used for long and thin routes from Australia to Southeast and East Asia that Qantas currently doesn't serve. Then there are the A350s which are part of Project Sunrise. Project Sunrise, for those of you that don't know, is Qantas's plan to fly non-stop from Sydney and Melbourne to New York, London, Paris and beyond. Routes that just 10 years ago really were barely even imaginable. The first of these routes are now expected to launch in 2025. My guess is business class fares will be selling for the bargain basement price of around, I don't know, $12,000 one way. Our gate area was a bit cramped because of the odd shape of it, but boarding began just a few minutes behind schedule so it wasn't that much of a problem, especially since I could watch this Qatar 777 being towed in. By the way, I've got two Qatar long-haul videos coming up in a few months. Time to get on board. Let's check out today's flight stats. We nearly took off on time and made our way up to 40,000 feet for our three-hour Trans-Tasman service to Brisbane, where we landed 12 minutes ahead of schedule. Stepping on board, we received a warm welcome from the purser, and I made my way to the second economy section. I've always been a fan of Qantas's onboard color scheme, and the A330 is no different. The seats are handsome, and for the most part, in good condition. The seat itself is comfortable, but the thing that I can't believe is how crappy the legroom is. Every seating website out there shows seat pitch on these A330 200s to be 31 to 32 inches. I simply don't believe it. Maybe I was in one of those odd rows that just had an inch less or something, but I'm just six foot tall, and I've never had my knees touch the seat in front of me on a long haul aircraft on a full service airline in economy before. On each seat upon boarding were a pair of headphones which plugged into the armrest, where there was also controls for the IFE. There was also a USB port next to the monitor. Thankfully, there were also overhead vents. So, either Australians are much taller than I remember, or the seat backs are just really short. The safety video began and we pushed back.
Our taxi took us past the domestic terminal, dominated by Air New Zealand, and we made our way to the runway, lining up for a westerly takeoff. The spool up and take off are coming up next. Admittedly, not the best seat for takeoff views. I did fix the angle on landing, though. Our route today was straightforward enough to the northwest over the Tasman Sea. Before our meal service begins, let's take a quick look at the in-flight entertainment, which had a decent selection of movies. The screen was definitely not the most responsive thing in the world, though. Time for lunch service. We had a choice of two options. Either pork sausages with onion relish, mashed potatoes and peas, or mac and cheese with panko and spinach. Not gonna lie, the menu felt a bit like an elevated kid's menu. But it was in fact really tasty, and was a significant portion as well. Coffee and tea service followed after. Now for the 10 second toilet tour. It was a little bit grimy and a little bit messy. Something I'd expect maybe after 10 hours, but not so much on a short flight like today. We approached a cloudy coastline as the sun was beginning to hang low in the sky, doing a bit of a zigzag over the Morton Bay before landing from the northeast. and check out this double rainbow that followed us all the way into our landing. After my morning rainbow over the Park Hyatt earlier this morning, kind of felt like they were following me. An uneventful landing led us to a beautiful taxi to the very, very end of the International Terminal. So, the flight was fine. Could have been better, could have been worse. One of the reasons I like choosing wide-body aircraft for shorter flights, though, is because they're generally more comfortable. Many airlines offer an extra inch or so of legroom, but that theory fell flat today.
But most of that is forgiven with some beautiful aircraft views like this though. So, I really do hope that you enjoyed this video today. If you did, please be sure to click that thumbs up button and subscribe with notifications on so you don't miss out on any of my upcoming content. Next time though, I'll show you that other rainbow at the Park Hyatt Auckland. Oh, and thanks for watching till the end.